This is the story of a great queen. Keeping alive a tradition of ocean-going giants, Cunard are building their newest superliner. She's being constructed in record time in a shipyard in Italy, much faster than the legendary Cunardas of the 1930s, built on the Clyde. This is the fastest ship that we have done up to now in six months. Honestly speaking, it is a challenge for us. Just six months after her keel was laid, the new Queen Elizabeth has been floated out of dry dock and prepared for fitting out. It's January 2010. Her maiden voyage is set for October the 12th. Some are starting to wonder if, in just 15 months, it's possible to build, fit out and deliver one of Britain's greatest liners. The 12th of October we have our maiden voyage and we certainly can't let those guests down. In a shipyard near Venice, Cunard's newest superliner, Queen Elizabeth, is just nine weeks away from delivery to Southampton, the company's home port. It's the end of July. Cunard's president, Peter Shanks, is hosting a visit by American reporters. Though the ship is far from finished, liveried bellboys have been flown in for the day to provide a link with the transatlantic liners of the 1930s. At 92,000 tons, the new Queen Elizabeth is bigger and heavier than her predecessor, launched in 1938. But the Art Deco interiors of the old liner have provided the inspiration for the new. Art director Amy Lucena is feeling the pressure, but determined that her fellow Americans should have the best impression of the interior, even though the main artworks have yet to be installed. And on a ship where health and safety rules, she's dressed for the occasion. I've gotten in a little trouble for it. No, I actually haven't, but nonetheless, a lot of staring. The ship will be ready. We've become the faux painting and the faux marbleizing and the installation of murals only. And we'll continue with that uh, until about the first week of August. And then uh, glass will start being installed and murals and framed art. In the theater, they're laying the carpet and bringing in the first seats. The design is a tribute to the 19th century English theaters of Frank Matcham, who designed the London Coliseum. Entertainment's director, Martin Lilly, wants to get in here as soon as possible so that his theatre company can start rehearsing their stage show. We are six weeks away from seeing cast on stage rehearsing, so it's really, uh, we're getting to an exciting time. I'm currently managing teams that are producing shows and teams that are helping us to deliver the ship, and it all has to come together at the same time, and I'm very comfortable that that is going to happen and the Britannia restaurant is being fitted out. Hotel manager Robert Howey has come on board to work out how to serve 2,000 guests at the same time. So we've got just under 1,000 crew on board the ship, uh, which of that, there's almost 900 who belong to the hotel department, so quite a large number who we've got to get through the training and obviously uh, get them up to speed with you know, what the new concepts are. You know, to see it from, from the design stage, you know, working with interior designers, you know, co putting concepts together, um, and then finally seeing it all come together uh, physically on board is it's fantastic, it really is great. We've got some, uh, some challenging times ahead, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not saying everything's perfect, you know, but we've got some uh, very tight timelines, uh, but from my side it's, it's um, proven. I mean, I was over here about a month ago, and you can see a huge difference uh, in the ship, and, uh, you know, if they keep that momentum going, we'll be, we'll be fine. Like her predecessors, the original Queen Elizabeth of 1938 and the QE2 of 1969, this ship will be working on a big scale. Every year, its kitchens will use 12,940 pounds of salmon, 120,000 bottles of champagne, and 954,681 tea bags. All this is good copy for the American journalists. Apart from being owned by an American company, Cunard knows that a third of its passengers will come from the United States, so this visit is vital. It's the first time we revealed a number of these areas and we're also putting out little vignettes. We put some of the art up 
we're going to show some of the cutlery and the plates in the veranda grill. So just slowly getting people to understand how the ships come into life. And they're excited, it's going well. There may be plenty of activity, but Queen Elizabeth is still slightly behind schedule, though they're catching up. We're pretty much on track. Um, and all those areas that were slightly behind have now all caught up and their yard, I have to say, are working very hard. I think there's over 1,600 workers on the ship today as we're going around. They have what's called these S-curves that look at the time and the amount of work still to be done. And it varies by room and they were a little bit behind in some of the areas eight weeks ago. But now they've really worked their socks off and it's really amazing to see how much work has been done, particularly in the last two months. 12th of October we have our maiden voyage and we certainly can't let those guests down. Harley Crossley's portrait of the ship is in and the Grand Lobby is almost ready to receive the 18 foot high marquetry panel designed by David Lindley. Lindley is contracted to deliver his creation by September the 1st but that date may slip because the panel sections are only just being cut at a workshop in Wiltshire. Craftsman Michael Beckingham is putting together a picture which shows the Queen Elizabeth conquering the world, whose different parts are made of wood veneers. On this section I've just done is just here overlooking the bow of the boat. As you can see, it is made up of light grey sycamore and black stained sycamore as well. And it's got some Macassar ebony stringing going around the outside for the detail. At the last minute, the design has had to be altered to include stringers, lines which will provide extra definition. This uh, stringing wasn't in the original plans at first. Uh, it was just butted together through the actual laser cut. Um, but it didn't quite show up when you stood further back, so this has had to be quickly re designed to show up more detail. As you can see, it's all sort of starting to come together as each piece goes, goes in. You can actually see, well, start to see the actual image itself. But working on such a big piece of art brings its own challenges. I'm having to kneel on these foam pads so I don't damage the actual face as this is the side that the passengers will be able to actually see. Um, this is the uh, biggest panel I've ever worked on. I can't actually say I've got on the actual table itself to put in any pieces or, or do anything to it. So this is a uh, first for me. The whole lot has been an interesting experience. Linley is mixing traditional skills with high technology. When the computerized laser cutter has done its job, and Michael Beckingham has assembled all the pieces. The panel will be glued, heated and pressed and left for 24 hours to set. David Lindley is not the only British artist racing to finish a contribution to the interior of the new Cunada. At Buckingham Palace, the Queen has agreed to sit for a portrait to hang in the ship which will bear her name. And Cunard have given the commission to 31-year-old Isabel Peachy. I went to the tradesman's entrance my first visit and discovered that that was the wrong entrance to go to and was told that I had to go to the main entrance around the front of the palace which took me by surprise. Talking to the Queen means that actually you don't at the end of the day get a lot of a lot of time within that hour to do the sketching so you have to use that time as best possible. Um, I attempted sketching, but in the end found that photography was the best way to get as much information as possible so that when I came back to the studio, I had images to work from. Cunard gave me ideas. They wanted the Queen in a relaxed setting, um, three-quarter length portrait, in a chair with jewels, evening dress, and possibly with a fireplace. So in a way I was directed, which means that I had a better idea of, of what kind of portrait they would like. Isabel Peach's portrait of the Queen will hang in the Grand Lobby. It will be the first piece of art passengers see when they come aboard.
I find that concentrating on the painting you have to do is more important. Getting a feel for what you want the image to look like and, and just letting it evolve and tweaking it here and there when you are considering the place that it's going to go into. But, you know, thinking of, of who's going to see it, when they're going to see it, that just makes me nervous. So, <laughs> so I was avoiding, I suppose, thinking too much about the whole thing. Famously, the Queen never comments on portraits, so Isabel isn't expecting a reaction from the palace. But it's enough to have been given such a prestigious commission. I feel very privileged to be given this opportunity and um, so early on in my career that's something that I never would have thought would happen full stop. Britain's royal family has had a long connection with Cunard. In 1946 the young Princess Elizabeth accompanied her mother on board the first Queen Elizabeth for its sea trials. The Second World War had interrupted the ships fitting out, but now, in peacetime, there was everything to play for. The Queens were great dollar earners. And because of the position of Southampton and New York, they could do this weekly service. So every Wednesday, one of the ships left either Southampton or New York. They'd arrive the following Monday, the opposite side, two days for refuel and reprovision, embark new passengers and sail again. Because they were earning so many dollars, they were making money. I was in England until 1947, and when you boarded the ship on the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, there were suddenly things you hadn't seen in Britain for a long time, like white bread, all the butter you wanted, not margarine. So these were immensely successful ships, fast, smart, beautifully run, and uh, delivered on a weekly mail service. But the days of the transatlantic liners were numbered. With the arrival of jet aircraft in the late 1950s, passengers started to desert the Queens. On some of the winter crossings to New York, there were just 15 regulars in first class. In 1967, the venerable Queen Mary was sold to Long Beach in California to become a floating attraction and hotel. The Queen Elizabeth ended up in the hands of a Chinese businessman who planned a floating university. But in January 1972, the ship which had been the pride of Britain's merchant fleet mysteriously caught fire in Hong Kong Harbor. She burned out in Junk Bay, and I went to see her in 1973, my first visit to Hong Kong. I hired a junk and had to draw pictures for the captain, who spoke no English at all. I drew pictures of a uh, two-funnel ship lying on its side. He said, oh, yes, and so we went out, and I could show my children the ship on which they'd crossed many times, now lying drunkenly, rusted, derelict on its side, a, a terrible sight. It's the agonizing end of a life that had an agonizing beginning too. So Queen Elizabeth, poor old Queen Elizabeth, suffered at each end of her life uh, terribly unsettling conditions. Cunard commissioned a new ship for a new age. Like her predecessors, the QE2 was built on the Clyde. Launched in 1967, she was a combined transatlantic liner and cruise ship, something the 1930 ships weren't designed for. And like the earlier queens, the QE2 became a national icon. But after nearly 40 years in service, she was too costly to operate too expensive to refit. By the time Cunard retired her in 2008, the company had built two new superliners, Queen Mary II and Queen Victoria, but they really needed a third. And in nine weeks, they will have it. First though, the Queen Elizabeth must be tested at sea. And for that, she's joined by her captain, Chris Wells. 
Though the ship is still under the control of Think Antieri, it's vital that Captain Wells is here to observe the sea trials, which include tests on the electronic systems under power, the stabilizers and the engines. You're always going to be comparing it to what has gone before, previous versions, maybe the QE2, the Queen Mary 2, and obviously Queen Victoria. Queen Elizabeth takes to the open sea for the first time in her life. It's an exciting moment with a serious purpose. Not only will this huge ship be rolled to 35 degrees to ensure that she won't capsize, she'll also be required to undertake an endurance test in which the engines must run at 100% power. Now, that endurance test consists of eight continuous hours running at sea with everything running and nobody is allowed to get involved in the operation of the ship that runs on its own for eight hours complete. For the endurance test in particular, we were running all six diesel generators. This ship, we don't need to run all six. Five it will give us enough power to provide the maximum rated power into the propulsion motors. They're rated at 17.6 megawatts each. So we were running at 35.2 megawatts across the two pods continuously for eight hours. The Queen Elizabeth completes her sea trials off the Italian coast and passes the test with flying colors. While she's been at sea, work on the fitting out has had to stop. Now, the race is on again to complete the interior in time for the handover on September the 30th. At last, Queen Elizabeth is recognizably a luxury liner. In three months, the transformation has been remarkable. The staircase between the two levels of the Britannia restaurant, the restaurant itself, the Royal Court Theatre, and the Grand Lobby. For so long, a mass of scaffolding, but now the very heart of the ship, complete with David Lindley's marquetry panel. The winning entry in the national competition, Peter Simpson's sculpture, is in place. So the art installations are almost complete. That I will unveil the portrait. All that remains is Isabel Peach's portrait of the Queen, which is unveiled in London at the end of September. It will be added to the ship when it reaches Southampton in 10 days' time. The end is in sight. September the 30th, 2010. The day the Italian shipbuilders Fincantieri have promised to hand over their latest ship to Cunard. The Queen Elizabeth is ready for her delivery voyage to Southampton, the company's home port. But she's not completely finished. 200 shipyard workers will travel with her right up to the last minute. Okay, good, good. Captain Chris Wells is meeting some of the thousand crew and hotel staff who've joined in the past few days. Most have come from other ships in the Cunard fleet, Queen Mary II and Queen Victoria, which was Captain Wells' last command. His task is to mold them into a team in just eight days the time it will take to sail the Queen Elizabeth from Italy to the UK. Work never stops, not even for the formal handover. At 11 o'clock, with two signatures and a minimum of fuss, 92,000 tonnes of ocean liner becomes the property of Cunard. OK, there we are. Thank you. Okay. Well, we've taken delivery of Queen Elizabeth, but um, I'm nervous now about making sure all the events in Southampton go well, and obviously our maiden voyage, the expectations of our guests. So. I guess we're always nervous looking to the future, but today is a day of great confidence. Um, we have the ship, and you know our friends at Fincantieri have delivered for us, and the magic part now is seeing our own crew, our, our Cunard staff, bringing the ship to life. The house flag, which Sir Samuel Cunard would have recognized, is hoisted, and the ship's company is on its own. This is the captain. Attention, ship's company. The ship is ours. Okay. 
Effective immediately, ship's engineering staff are responsible in the engine control room. Ship's deck officers are responsible for safety systems being monitored on the bridge. The ship's medical staff are responsible for primary medical care. Godspeed, Queen Elizabeth. After 15 months, Queen Elizabeth is leaving on time, exactly as the shipyard promised. Those who can spare the time crowd onto deck to mark a key moment in the life of their ship. Captain Wells is not yet totally in control. He must use a local pilot to navigate the channels around the shipyard at Monfalcone before setting off down the eastern side of Italy. The delivery voyage is a test in itself. The first time Queen Elizabeth's engines will have been run continuously for eight days. She'll steer a course through the Adriatic, past Sicily, along the coast of North Africa, through the Strait of Gibraltar and up the Bay of Biscay. Fincantieri's workers must be allocated cabins. Places have to be found for their tools and they'll need three meals a day. If they complete their tasks, they'll get off in Spain when the ship stops briefly at Algeciras. If not, they'll carry on to Southampton, where the ship will arrive just three days before her naming by the Queen to become the newest addition to Britain's merchant fleet. We are British. We're proud to be British, and uh, we take Britishness with us wherever we go. Having said that, we have a very international ship's company, we have 50 different nationalities working on board, and we have a huge advantage. 85% of our ship's company are already true Cunardas, so we get off to an absolutely flying start. For those staff, this is the first opportunity to explore their new home, to find out the difference between it and the ships they've served in before, and to appreciate the artwork which connects this liner with the great transatlantic queens of the 1930s. Art director Amy Lucena had planned to be home in California by now, but there's simply too much to do. She'd be working down to the wire to install models and memorabilia and to combine it with the new art like David Lindley's marketry panel in the grand lobby. I was a bit concerned about some of the color and I am thrilled with how it turned out for the Grand Lobby. It just flows very easily. So we've succeeded in uh, bringing her out of her older sister's shadow a bit. She was a larger ship than her older sister Queen Mary and she had just as much of a magnificent war record and all of these types of history as her sister but has been a bit of the stepchild. So we've succeeded in bringing her forward. I think there's a very cohesive thread throughout the entire ship between the beautiful glass and the marble and the furnishings and the lighting. And there's really a strong Art Deco thread through the entire ship, which is what we were looking for to kind of bring that golden age of cruising back to life. The love is in the details. Really, you have to get the little parts right. And maybe no one else will notice, but it adds to the ambiance of the ship. And we really work on getting the small things right. If you do that, the larger things fall into place. And action! Since the artwork has only just been uncovered, marketing director Richard Curtis has had to wait until the delivery voyage to take photographs for the company's brochures and video for the website. Everything has to look exactly as it would do on a normal Cunard voyage. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of attention to detail, as you can imagine, to get the, the table set precisely to get the waiting staff dressed exactly as they would be on a formal night, the lighting right, and to create that ambiance and the elegance that we need. For the past year, Richard has had to rely on artist impressions. Now he gets to use the real thing. Compared to Queen Victoria at the same stage, she's looking good at the moment. Queen Victoria, we still did have quite a lot of plastic sheeting that needed to be removed and dust covers, etc. That's already been done, so yeah, she is looking, looking, looking wonderful. We'll be in Southampton in a week's time, so um, yeah, all set. 
Ten days from now, the marketing department's models will be replaced by real guests on the maiden voyage. And in the new year, Queen Elizabeth will start her first world cruise, three months at sea for passengers who are prepared to pay up to £118,000 per person for the privilege. Hotel manager Robert Howey will have to feed them. 2,000 guests spread across five restaurants. The crew are all here now. Obviously, we've got 1,005 of them here. They're all living on board, obviously. And uh, we've uh, got the majority of our stores. Within the next few days, before we get back to Southampton, we've got to find everything. Um, but I think we're, we're almost there. Almost there. It's looking good. We've tried to stage it, you know, as, as and when we need things. You know, obviously, with the crew move on board, there's certain items that you require. Um, you know, you hang us, for example, in crew cabins. Uh, you know, you also have to have the main laundry up and running, so we needed all the linen. So you've got to plan it quite, uh, quite well in advance. So the logistics are, can be quite demanding at times. In the main kitchens, chefs will soon be providing 6,000 meals every day. Meanwhile, they're trying out their menus on 200 Italian shipyard workers who are being introduced to roast beef, bread and butter pudding, and treacle sponge. Queen Elizabeth rounds the southern tip of Italy and takes the Strait of Messina past Sicily. At the beginning of October, it's calm in the Mediterranean, which makes the job of preparing this ship much easier for crew and staff. In the Queen's room, they're rehearsing the dance sequences for the nightly cabaret. And in the Royal Court Theatre, they're putting the finishing touches to the shows for the maiden voyage. We've got 13 different elements of production show which will be featured on board Queen Elizabeth. They will vary between seven minutes and a full 55 minutes, but all of those set pieces have to live together. So our production team is spending as much time rehearsing on stage, backstage, to ensure they can logistically get all the pieces in the right order, in the right place, and look after them as well. At 15 knots, it will take five days to cross the Mediterranean. Work goes on night and day to finish a ship which must look pristine when the Queen steps on board, followed by passengers for the maiden voyage a day later. Among the ship's company, there's a sense that they're part of a great endeavor. Following in the wake of those who designed, built, and manned the Queen Mary, the original Queen Elizabeth, and the QE2. The passengers of the 21st century will probably be as demanding as those who went before. Will the staff of this floating hotel be up to the challenge? Only time will tell. In the veranda restaurant, staff are unpacking knives and forks and setting tables. Passengers who ate in the original veranda on the first Queen Elizabeth were offered turtle soup with sherry and calves head. Today, they can expect something more modern from the French Michelin star chef, Jean-Marie Zimmerman. Yeah, okay, so that, that's it, yeah? So, you know, you really have to make sure that they don't oxidize. Here I'm sitting in the, in the veranda, the veranda restaurant, okay, which is a French restaurant where I am the chef patron. And believe me, uh, I'm so excited to actually tonight have my first audience and do my first service. Tonight, Zimmerman will try out his gourmet menu for the first time. He's had just two days to train his chefs to work as he wants them to. There's no point cooking the duck too soon, yeah? I'd rather you do the veg a little bit later, or you put a bit more fluid. 
With three ships and the fleet, the executive chef can't be everywhere. So he's had to involve others in creating menus and maintaining standards. We create them, we taste them, you know. I'm the one who sourced the products around the world and so forth, but when it comes together, they are there with me, cooking, tasting, you know. We repeat that several times before we get it right. You know, it's, it's like an artist. I mean, it's never such thing where you say, okay, bingo, it's going to be good the first time. No, uh, because it has to come together, the combination has to be right, you know, the cooking process, the techniques, the timing, and, uh, of course, the taste. It's a nice color, yeah? Did you taste it yourself? Yes, sir. Huh? Did you taste it, James? Yeah, let's, have yeah, let's just have a little bit of a bite there. That is amazing. Honestly, it's fantastic. Presentation is very important. But for me, in order for people to come back into a restaurant, it is the taste. You have to remember that taste and say, well, I want to go back and eat this. That's really the thing. Some of the Cunard staff have been chosen as guinea pigs. On the delivery voyage, this is one of the most coveted invitations. Four days into the trip from Italy to England, Queen Elizabeth faces another first, heavy seas. Off the Algerian coast, the wind freshens, and 200 Fincantieri workers discover that being at sea in one of their ships can be very different from being in a dry dock. The new Cunada faces up to the westerly winds as she heads for southern Spain, and the ship's company holds its breath. How will the ship perform in rough seas? In the engine room, chief engineer Colin Black wants to see how the engines and the azipods, the steerable propellers, perform in these challenging conditions. The engines, the azipods, stabilizers, steering, everything was fantastic, really. The first time we got our hands on it was when the company paid for the ship. And that was on the last day, before, on the day we sailed from the yard. And it was such a pleasure and, and proud moment to, to walk into the ACR and Cunard engineers to control the ship without asking any engineer from Fincantieri on how we start, how we stop any systems. We just walked straight in, we took charge of the ship and we've been operating the ship since we left at Monfalcone on the 30th of September. The Mediterranean settles down but the Bay of Biscay lies ahead before the ship reaches British waters. Queen Elizabeth is starting to feel like a fully functioning passenger liner. There's time for a family photograph. There certainly won't be time for one when she's in service. And thoughts turn to the arrival in Southampton. That's going to be a very exciting moment, the Cunard Line been running their transatlantic liners in particular out of Southampton since before the Second World War. Both Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary ran from Southampton to New York. It is Southampton that is uh, marked, painted, stenciled on the stern, the transom of this magnificent vessel. And so we have a great affinity with the city and a great history going back all those years. Work doesn't stop. Queen Elizabeth pauses in Spain to take on supplies, then hurries north. And by October the 8th, Cunard's newest liner is entering Britain's western approaches. She's complete, on time, and ready for a right royal welcome. October the 8th, 2010. Cunard's newest ship is in British waters for the first time. Just 15 months after her keel was laid in the Fincantieri shipyard near Venice, the Queen Elizabeth is ploughing through the English Channel bound for Southampton, the company's home port. Southampton docks are quiet today. A far cry from their heyday in the 40s and 50s when they saw the world come and go every day. 
Whether it was Union Castle ships linking Britain with the remains of empire, or the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth running their weekly shuttle to New York, Southampton never slept. Boat trains arrived hourly from London. It seemed that every family in this city had a connection with the sea. Which may be why so many have turned out to see the new arrival. At nine o'clock on a Friday morning, Southampton stops briefly to welcome a successor to the great Queens. A reminder of the days when Southampton relied solely upon the sea. It's three days before this ship will be named by the Queen. Cunard are using the weekend to show the Queen Elizabeth to travel agents, tour operators and its favoured guests, the people who are likely to be their greatest critics. Captain Wells knows that some of them will have to be persuaded to break their allegiance to other ships in the Cunard fleet. And the company have invited the artists who contributed to the interior design to come on board. Harley Crossley is seeing his painting in situ for the first time. As an artist, you always try and do the best you possibly can, but at the end of the day, sometimes you look at your painting and you think, oh, I don't know, it's not quite as good as I expected, but this, this is better than I expected. I'm delighted with it. Upstairs in the Commodore Club, Robert Lloyd gets to inspect the huge mural of Cunard's three ships meeting in Southampton in 2008. When you see a painting, um, as you saw in the studio, when it's basically just pasted on the wall, um, it's not sort of finished, it's not framed. So here, it's framed, it looks like you're looking through a window, I just think it looks lovely. Um, and uh, just fantastic. Yeah. We're um, sort of lost for words, to be honest with you. One painting is missing. At the last minute, Isabel Peach's portrait of the Queen arrives from London to be installed in the grand lobby. It'll be the first picture guests see as they come aboard. Oh, higher than that. There we go, that's good. That's perfect. Harley Crossley, Robert Lloyd, and Isabel Peachy have been invited to the naming ceremony, along with hundreds of other guests from the world of shipping and showbiz. They're here to see the Queen do something she last did in 1967, bestow her name on a Cunard ship. Then it was the QE2. Today it's simply Queen Elizabeth. In a tour of the new ship, the Queen admires the panel created by her nephew and meets Isabel Peachy, who last saw her in those nervous portrait sittings at Buckingham Palace. I was nervous. I, d I didn't think I would be, but um, not having been on a ship like this before, I didn't know what to expect. And to see the painting in, in situ and how beautiful the Grand Lobby is and the ship, and to be meeting the Queen on the same day as well, it, it was a, a nerve wracking but wonderful experience. The band of the Scots Guards reminds those American guests in the audience that this is a very British ship. Peter Shanks, Cunard's president, reminds the Queen of her long involvement with the company. And there was only one person here who can claim presence at all three Elizabeth namings, and that person is Her Majesty the Queen. And then, 464 days after the keel laying, Queen Elizabeth is officially christened. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth. May God bless her and all who sail in her. The great endeavor of designing, building, fitting out, delivering and naming a 92,000 ton ocean-going liner is over. Now the real work begins. Three cheers for Her Majesty the Queen. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip. Hooray. Hip hip.
the fact that Her Majesty was here now for the third Queen Elizabeth, it's just an amazing piece of uh, heritage for us and something that we can take with us forevermore. This has been the story of a modern ship built in record time. And no one is more relieved than Peter Shanks. It's terribly hard work building ships. And, you know, we had our ups and our downs, as you know, through the shipyard. They were terrific. It's been a wonderful partnership. And, yes, we had our tense moments towards the end, but we got there. I think the magic of our ship's company helped in the last few weeks to see them come on board and bring the ship to life. But then to share it today with so many people in the blazing sunshine, we could not have asked for a better day. Within 24 hours, those who will sail on the maiden voyage to the Canaries are being welcomed into the grand lobby. Most will have no idea of the sweat and love and tears that have gone into producing a ship on which they will spend the next two weeks. And that's the way Cunard wanted. For passengers on board the newest ship in Britain's merchant fleet, the operation must appear effortless just as it did to those who crossed the Atlantic 80 years ago. All that went before, the welding, the riveting, the painting, the endless meetings, the trials and tribulations, live on only in the minds of those who made it happen, and on film, as a record of how to build one of Britain's greatest ships.